Hello guys, my name is Johansson Quijano and uh, I will be presenting on visual rhetoric as a partial requirement for Dr. Jang's course, uh, Pedagogy of Technical Writing. I will be presenting two uh, texts, the first one of which is uh, the rhetoric of text design in professional communication. And uh, this text basically touches on uh, visual rhetoric in technical communication, what it is, it talks about intertextual structure of documents. It talks about intertextual structure of documents. It talks about the supertextual structure of documents. And uh, it takes into account typographical considerations. So let's start with uh, what involves visual rhetoric. Architectural design um, has been suggested by people as a vehicle for communication. And here we have an example of an architectural design that communicates that we need to move towards uh, a greener world. Product design has also been suggested as a form of rhetoric. And uh, I will let you look at this uh, can design for a few seconds and uh, come to your own conclusions. Um, I should think that that works as a form of rhetoric. Um, but, of course, what do you think? Why don't you comment on that? Then uh, people have said that visual elements are rhetorical figures and people have talked about how pictures communicate meanings in specific situational contexts and here's this very interesting uh, picture that integrates a lot of visual elements into their design in order to sell a product. So. Um, take a look at that and uh, make sure to leave your comments down below. And uh, some people have talked about the so-called rhetoric of neutrality of modern information design, which takes this form where everything's neutral, structured, and um, it, it pretty much doesn't lean too heavily towards anything other than pure neutrality. So what is the purpose of this piece? And the author says that his purpose is to elaborate on some rhetorical aspects of text design and on how contextual variables influence visual communication. Um, the author states that desktop publishing is changing the nature of practical communication, that professional communicators have access to a variety of typographical tools, and that therefore any discussion of the rhetoric of practical documents must encompass uh, the language of visual design. It's basically saying that visual elements are just as important as linguistic elements. Um, but what do you think? Do you think that typographical and visual considerations in a document are as important as the author makes them out to be? Or are they things that take a secondary role to linguistic considerations? So moving on to intertextual structure of documents. Um, visual language reinforces and sometimes reshapes rhetoric of the linguistic message. Right? This uh, takes form as follows. There you have five different instances of uh, a command. Please check all of your pressure val valves before you begin. Right? And uh, in the first one, we see that there is nothing highlighted. Um, in the second one, we see focus on police and pressure valves, which the author would argue um, is uh, an appeal to pathos, an emotional appeal. Um, the third one focuses on all of your pressure valves before you begin, which focuses on how many and when. Uh, the fourth one basically uh, communicates a sense of immediacy since all of it is highlighted. And uh, in the last one, uh, the focus is on the emotional plea, on how many of them you should check, and especially on the time, on the temporal consideration before you begin. And this sample is uh, directly from the text. Um, do you think that this uh, contextual variable changes the message, or not at all? Can you objectively say that all of these um, phrasing say the same thing, or does the focus really change uh, your perception of them? Right. And there's also intertextual structure of documents. 
Um, this one is the one that we're mostly familiar with and the one that most of work on. Um, at this level, it basically suggests that text is structured through alphanumeric cues like headings and numbers, spatial cues like distribution of text, and graphical cues like bullets and arrows. This is pretty much what we all think about when we're doing a PowerPoint presentation like this one. Uh, when we're working on a document, and pretty much when we're writing anything that involves text, um, technical communication. Right. And then the rhetorical strategies by these are uh, two main rhetorical strategies. First one has to do with the location of the bullets, um, you know, which pattern uh, heightens textual elements, meaning they're in bullet form, therefore they're important. And of course, a parallelism of the bullets imply that each item is equally as important as the previous and the one that comes after. Right? So these things have to do with intertextual uh, structure of documents. Um, and there is one more thing, um, and that's when you're doing charts, mapping relationships. Here, for example, we see the power structure between the partner, the project manager, and the staff engineer. We have a sort of top-down model that shows that the partner has more power than the project manager, uh, who has more power than the staff engineer. If you use this structure, then you see that they're more equal, that the partner suggests something to the project manager, who then suggests uh, those considerations forward to the staff engineer. Then there's the supertextual structure of documents, and these are more global considerations, um, such as section titles, page headers, tabs, page size, placement of extra textual elements, icons, page colors, textures, marks, and orientations. Basically, anything that you're going to be using throughout the entire document, font size, spacing, and so on. All of those would be supertextual considerations for the structure of the document. And the author suggests that to create visual hierarchies, you could use dividers or uh, title pages by section. This is an example that he uses, where, where you see um, headers separating uh, different sections of the document. Now, another consideration that you must keep in mind when dealing with the supertextual structure of documents is typography. Um, which must always be taken into account, um, especially in the context of audience and the desired effect of the text in that audience. Um, of course, to be fair, they also have to do with personal aesthetics. What do you think looks better, basically? Um, do you want the familiarity of Times New Roman or the neutral tone of Helvetica? Or do you just want to be fancy and use Old English or any other sort of fancy uh, font. Right? So here's uh, question number two for you guys to answer. Which of the three uh, textual structures of documents do you think is the most important and why? Is it inter, intra, or supra structural? Um, you can comment on that down below. And uh, the third question would be regarding typography. What typeface, what typeface do you prefer personally and why? And uh, as an activity, you could think of a specific instance of technical communication, either a memo, a letter, a proposal, and so on. And uh, you could think about what typeface would fit that specific situation better, and why. Um, you could use this activity, of course, with your students if you're teaching technical communication. So moving on to the next piece, uh, the next uh, article is the multiple media of texts, how on-screen and paper texts incorporate words, images, and other media. And uh, this piece starts off by uh, talking about what counts as visual elements, how do we transmit meaning, it raises us to questions that are, I think, very important. Uh, it talks about fonts as rhetorical elements, it talks about categories for analysis, and then it offers an approach for analyzing visual texts. Right? So what counts as visual elements? Um, according to the author of this piece, the visual presentation of a page on screen gives you an immediate sense of genre. So if you see a certain structure, you can say, oh, that's poetry. Uh, you know, if you, if you see something that's double-spaged, font size 12, you'll think that's student writing, 
Um, and here's an excellent example of that. Whenever you see something this colorful, you'll think, well, that's either a children's book or a comic book. Right? Um, the author says that all page and screen based texts are visual and that their visual elements can be analyzed. And certainly you can consider a uh, genre within this analysis. Do you have a genre that hides visual elements or that celebrates visual elements, as in academic writing versus comic books? Um, or perhaps something that might be a little bit in between, like a web page. Next, you have the visual elements and arrangements of a text perform persuasive work. The example that the author gives is a company logo, and if you look at these company logos, you'll see that each of them bring to mind a different idea. If you look at the Disney logo, you'll think about stuff made for children. But then there's always Beowulf, um, which Disney made a rendition of. If you think about the Toyota logo, you'll think about reliability um, and vehicles. But then there's that very recent debacle with uh, cars that automatically accelerated, right? Um, Harley Davidson, um, Coca Cola, each of those logos invoke a different idea in your mind. This is also true of logos that represent ideology. Um, this logo, for example, serves a very different persuasive uh, motive than this logo, both of them political, um, and uh, both of them invoke very strong images in the viewer's mind. Now, the author says that attitudes towards visual elements of the text can change over time. The example that he uses is illuminated uh, printing versus traditional printing versus online printing. And, and this is partly true. In the 18th and 19th century, you would get a preference for illuminated printing, um, such as William Blake's uh, Songs of Innocence and of Experience. Here we have the tiger. Um, later, you would have a preference for more straightforward pieces of text that you could just distribute to masses. And now we have a preference for online texts. Right. So, can you think of any other visual elements in a text? You can go ahead and answer that below in the comments section. Uh, moving on, the author talks about how we transmit meaning. The author says that we have paragraphs. Here we have an example of a paragraph. We have drawings and paintings that tr transmit meaning. Here we have an example of a painting. We have charts and graphs, and here you have a drawing of a chart that looks like Pac-Man. Um, we have video and animation. Um, here we have a, a screenshot of video. I should point out that video does not necessarily mean animated video. You could have something like uh, a news clip. You could have, um, you know, a short video of someone walking down uh, the coastline or something like that and that would count as a video transmitting uh, meaning and then animation would be uh, a different layer but, but they are to some extent intertwined then you have visual transitions like the ones that we are seeing here uh, and hyperlinks in uh, html and web page documents and we have sounds like uh, my voice for example so which of those forms that I've just mentioned um, do you think are the most useful and why? And, and I guess uh, going off that, if you had to choose only one of those forms to transmit meaning, which one would you use and why? Right. So the author also talks about fonts as rhetorical elements. Basically gives an overview of four different font styles. First one is Roman typefaces which are meant to imitate quill and ink. Some examples are Times New Roman, Garmon, and Baskerville. These are known for their little serifs. Those are um, these little things here. You see the T and the little squiggly line towards the bottom. That would be a serif. Right. You have modern typefaces, which were modern in the 18th century when they were created. and They were meant to reflect an enlightenment thought. The focus was on thin strokes like Bodoni and Bodoni Condense, which is um, even thinner. Then you have Egyptian typefaces, which have no curving transitions into serifs, like Courier New. And you have sans serifs typefaces, which are meant to reflect the practicality of the industrialized revolution. 
uh, and remove series. For example, Ariel, um, Estrangelo Edessa, and Helvetica. Um, I should make a note that Helvetica comes default with Mac computers, but if you have a PC, you will need to buy the Helvetica font, and it goes for anywhere between $500 to $2,000, depending on where you want to get it. So question about typefaces. Which typeface do you find the most useful for technical documents and why? And do you think that different typefaces should be used for different documents and uh, how so? The author then moves on to talk about different categories for analysis and uh, then puts forward a framework of analysis for the visual elements of a text. So the categories the author suggests are the title page or the screen what is on the page or on the screen, meaning the content, what helps readers make connections between multi-page texts, meaning uh, page numbers or perhaps hypertext links, what contains the page or the screen, meaning uh, if there are any frames or borders in the books, and for digital text it would be the internet browser. And his approach for analyzing the visual aspects of texts include naming the visual elements of a text. You would just name them. You wouldn't think about them just yet. You would name the design relationships between those elements. So how does the uh, web browser frame relate to what you see on the page? Is, does a page coding uh, make the browser change in any way? Those kind of considerations. And then you would consider how these elements connect with different audiences contexts and arguments right? so um, here's question 8 how would you modify the visual rhetoric analysis assignment to fit in your own classroom right? if you have any questions or comments make sure to post them below uh, my name is Johansson Quijano and uh, I hope you didn't hate my presentation too much